Good evening. I'm afraid I must begin with some sad news. We've lost two of our greatest men, the great radio astronomer, Sir Bernard Lovell, and also we've lost Neil Armstrong, the first man to set foot on the surface of the moon. And of course, we'll be talking about those, but on the good side, the Curiosity probe has landed safely upon Mars, and is working well, and sending back a mess of information. With me is Chris Glintos. Evening, Patrick. I can't wait to talk about Curiosity, but we should start by talking about both Neil Armstrong and uh, Sir Bernard. Um, you were involved in the early days at Jodrell Bank. The very early days of Jodrell Bank. That great telescope was only a, a madman's dream in those days. And uh, Bernard was working on radar, and he wanted me for trails. And so a lot of us were lying on our backs outside where the telescope now is, Plotting meteor trails. This was inspired by the fact they'd seen during the war, right? They'd seen that they got radar echoes from things in space, from meteors. And so that became a whole new field of research. What was he like as a person, though, in his heyday? Immense courage, total calmness under all situations, charm, he had that. If you tried to find a fault, it would be very difficult to do. Certainly I can't. What was he like as a cricketer? Very good batsman. I once had the pleasure of playing against him. Who came out on top? I really forget now. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the things that impresses me most looking back at, at Sir Bernard's life is how quickly things went from you lying on your back on Jodrell Bank to building what we now call the Lovell Telescope, that enormous, fully steerable radio telescope made up of bits of battleship and high technology. The Lovell Telescope in 50 years has done an amazing amount of science. And still is. Yes, Jodrell's the centre of uh, worldwide radio astronomy now, and that's entirely thanks to Sir Bernard Lovell. But for Bernard, radio astronomy wouldn't be as advanced as it actually is. Well, Sir Bernard was on the sky at night many times, but I particularly like this interview from 1981. I was at the meeting of the Royal Astronomical Society when you first made your suggestion of a huge radio telescope. How was it received by astronomers? I think my proposal for the telescope, uh, for which I was um, eventually given... Um, quarter of a million pounds, uh, I think it was referred to one or two astronomers who said they knew nothing about the subject and wouldn't it be better to build it in brick anyhow instead of steel? <laughs> and that is incredible, long looking back, that that was the state of knowledge about this subject. It simply didn't exist. And of course, while all of this was going on, we had the space race, Lovell was involved, and that brings us on to Neil Armstrong, who you also knew. I knew Neil very well. He came to talk to me almost as soon as he came down from that first flight. He was quiet, retiring, never pushed himself forward, in fact, quite the reverse, and immensely competent in all he did. Mm, and remarkably brave as well. Don't forget, when they came down on the moon, they had only four seconds worth of fuel left, and he had to decide then, do I go for a landing or do I abandon the landing blast back into orbit and give up the idea of being first on the moon. And to his eternal credit, he went with the formula, yeah. we'll land. When I heard Neil's voice coming through, the eagle has landed. I remember the feeling of overwhelming relief that came over me. One thing I should ask you about, because you'll probably know, is the, the famous phrase, one small step for a man. Ha. Was that Neil's? I mean, obviously, he delivered it, but did, was that some committee that came up with that, or was that him? No, he meant to say, one small step for a man. And he said to me afterwards, I fluffed it. <laughs> and the A got lost somewhere. <laughs> it, it did, it did. But did he come up with the phrase? Oh, yes. And he worked it out in great detail, practice and practice, and still he fluffed it. Well, we both know what that <laughs> feels like. Exactly. <laughs> That's one small step for a man. One giant for Mr. Armstrong, I needn't say what a great honor and privilege it is to have you with us for this evening's Sky at Night. I realize that when you were on the surface of the moon, you didn't have much time for looking upwards. But could you say something about what the sky looks like when you're on the moon? The sky is uh, a deep black uh, when viewed from the moon as it is when viewed from the space between the Earth and the moon. The Earth is the only visible object other than the sun that can be seen. 
the Earth is quite beautiful from space uh, and from the moon. It looks quite small and quite remote, but uh, it's very blue and covered with uh, white lace and <laughs> of the clouds. The continents are clearly seen, although they have very little color from that distance. We've put the full version of both of those interviews up on our website, so if you want to see them, go to bbc.co.uk slash sky at night. We always come out late, it's kind of tradition for the sky at night, we always have done. <laughs> well, we've lost them, but their work lives on. And of course, work is going on at pace. The Mars Curiosity Probe is down on the surface of the red planet and doing marvellous work already. Curiosity is NASA's latest mission to Mars. It's taken years to develop, and it's the most advanced vehicle ever to be sent to another planet. This is NASA putting it through its paces in the lab, and you can see how big it is. It's the size of a mini, but it weighs over a tonne. Thanks to a small nuclear power source, it should have enough oomph to climb a Martian mountain. Fire. But its size and its weight mean that Curiosity needed something really rather special to reach the surface. Lift off of the Atlas V with Curiosity. Curiosity, then known as Mars Science Laboratory, was launched last November. And in early August, finally arrived at the top of the Martian atmosphere. With us to discuss Curiosity from University College London, Dr. Peter Grindrod, and of course, Chris North. And Chris, it's been a really exciting couple of weeks. It's been incredibly exciting. I mean, it all started for us early in the morning, uh, on that morning, the, the 6th of August here, when, when Curiosity landed. An incredibly exciting event, because the landing was just so, uh, so exciting. I mean, with everything that's going on, it had a sky crane and... Uh, and thrusters and a parachute and all these things to, to, to make the landing incredibly exciting. The dreadful seven minutes. Yeah, the seven minutes of terror, they called it, where, where for seven minutes there was nothing they could do. It was running on its own. It's, it's 14 light minutes away on Mars, so it took 14 minutes oh, yeah. for any signals to get back. Absolutely nothing that could be done. And its, its target was, was Gale Crater on the surface, but it was an incredibly exciting journey down. Pete, can you start talking us through uh, what had to happen to get it safely onto the ground? Yeah, so there are a number of things that had to happen. The first is to enter the atmosphere at the right point so that the heat shield could slow the craft down enough to, to slow it down from 13,000 miles an hour down to, you know, about 1,000 miles an hour by the time the atmosphere had done its job, and at which point the parachute could then come out for the first time. And the heat shield's ejected, and we actually had some amazing pictures oh, of the yes. heat shield. We got them later, not live. But the heat shield falling down across the Marshall Service, it's quite remarkable to be able to see this in a descent. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers in descending. We even got a photo of Curiosity on, on its parachute. From the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. It's great to be able to see this, to have a spacecraft take a picture of another spacecraft descending, but that wasn't the hard bit. What happened next? Curiosity dropped down away from its back shell and parachute. We are in powered flight. <laughs> and then moved away from the parachute and left it behind and then start to descend on its own powered rockets then. So coming down, uh, kind of eight thrusters controlled it, slowed it down, make sure it was all smooth. It slows down to an almost kind of stop hovering above the surface. The sky crane has started. So on about 20 metres above the surface, then Curiosity, the rover part, then descended on its own kind of cables on this sky crane technology. This was the part that we'd never seen anything like this before. You have to be stable. Patrick, I don't know what you thought, but this I looked thought, completely insane to me. I thought, this is not going to work. You, Jeff, is good. <laughs> Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. <laughs> Chris, why did they have to do this? Previous rovers had bounced to a stop, so why have this complicated sky crane? Curiosity is the size of a small car. Too and it, heavy. Yeah, it's too heavy. It weighs a tonne. Uh, that's far too heavy to bounce down on air bikes, which is, which is what previous, previous rovers have done. The, o the other problem is that it had to come down on these thrusters, but you don't want the thing to land on thrusters, you want it to land on wheels. So it couldn't have the thrusters uh, on the rover itself, and besides, that's, that's dead weight you've got to drive around. So once it's landed on the surface, this, this sky crane, this jetpack, if you like, uh, has done its job and gets sent off to go and crash elsewhere on the surface. 
a few hundred metres away. Well, out of the way. Word came back that it was safely down, and then almost immediately we got the first <laughs> images coming back. You could see that Curiosity was on a flat surface, it wasn't tilted, it looked safe, and then even straight away you could start to see some things in the distance. The thing that's affected me is the view. This is a view across the plane of, of Gale Crater, the floor of Gale Crater, which is very flat, looking towards the raised rim. It's about two kilometres high, the rim, at this point. And it's quite eroded, so it's not a sharp crater rim, and it's a bit kind of hazy because there's dust in the atmosphere be before that we get there. Um, but to me, you know, it does look like Mars, but there's a, a kind of earthliness about this image. It looks familiar when you, when you look at this image, you recognise features. Is this Mars or Earth? Have we made some dark slip of sleep? <laughs> oh, it's definitely Mars. Definitely Mars. So that's why we needed that Mars reconnaissance orbiter shot of definitely. it on the way down. I think one of the surprising things about this image is actually the, the scale. So the, the crater rim that we're seeing in that image there is, is something like 50 kilometres away. It's, it's quite a long way in the distance. And as, as, as Pete said, it's, it's two kilometres high. It's a big rim. It's the same area as Wales, to use a, 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 a normal unit of measurement in, in, in areas. So it, it, is, it is a big place. and, and the other images we've got besides the rim, of course, are the, the central mountain. This mountain in the centre, which is the reason we're, we're at Gale. Mount Sharp. Mount Sharp. And it's a big one, right? How, what is it, three kilometres from base to it's top? It's bigger, about five. Uh, so, so on Earth, that's like Kilimanjaro size, something it's, like that. It's so massive, is... yeah. Well, Mount Sharp is distinctive, but um, why is you there for this particular landing? The reason that Mount Sharp's interesting is because it's five kilometres of rock, but more than that, it's, it's layered rock. And these layers are almost like a timeline, a history of events, of the environments that have existed on Mars. And basically, the further down you go in this mountain towards the base, the further back in time we hope we can actually analyse. One thing I noticed that was very odd, um, but predictable, when you look at those photos showing the wheel tracks, they appear to start oh, in the yes. middle of nowhere which feels very, very strange. It's almost I mean, like it just dropped out of the sky. Well, it did, <laughs> exactly, or was lowered out yeah. of the sky. So why is the arm important? What, what role does that play in the mission? Well, it's a two-metre-long arm. It's got this turret on the end that weighs 30 kilograms. That's more than, you know, the payload on some of the missions to Mars in the past. And that, that arm can not only analyse the rocks up close with a hand lens, a magnifier, and uh, a spectrometer as well, but it can also take samples from, from the ground. It can take a dust sample, or it can actually drill into a rock take some of the material off the, the rocket from inside it and then bring the sample back onto the body of the, the rover. Up to now, each probe has um, done what previous probes have done, but done it better. But this one is entirely new. It's a league, it's a league above yeah. the rest, right? It's got more, it's got ten instruments on board. I think the one that's got the most attention, just because of what it is, is ChemCam, which comes with a laser and quite a powerful laser at that. So um, if you'd like to explain why we put a robot with a laser on Mars, I think that, that might be good. It sounds like something out of science fiction. It yeah. is, absolutely. I think do it because we can. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a great instrument, so it means that rather than having to go up close to a rock to either take a sample or analyse it in situ, you can actually fire this laser from up to about seven metres away and analyse what the rock is made of. And then that gives you results in itself. You know, the laser vaporises the rock and you can analyse the plasma that's given off. But then if that's really interesting, then actually maybe you want to drive over there, take a sample and analyse it in even more detail on board. But it means you, your first step doesn't have to be to go and get a sample. Absolutely, yes. And it also means we can access rocks that otherwise we wouldn't be able to drive up close to. It's pure Doctor Who. It really yeah. is. What does understanding Gale tell us about the possibility of life on Mars? Well, understanding the geology tells us that, you know, what the environment was like when the rocks were laid down and how they've changed. Now, it's the environment of Mars that, you know, tells us how habitable areas like Gale Crater actually were in the past. But Curiosity's not actually going to ask, was there life there? It's just going to ask, was it habitable? Could there have been life there? I've seen a few people talking about fossils. Is there, is there any hope at all? Are you talking about sedimentary rocks, after all, which is where you find fossils uh, on Earth? It is. I mean, the cameras will be capable of seeing anything like that, but we don't expect to see anything as big as, as fossilised you know, on, on Mars. Instead, when we're talking about life, the possibility of life on Mars, we're talking about microbial stuff, you know, very early in its history, and very, very small. And so the instruments on Curiosity are designed to, to analyse the organics, the, the rocks, the minerals and things, but probably isn't capable of, of actually finding those microbial stuff. All I will say is... I expect the unexpected. <laughs> well, 
Thank you, Peter, and both Chris's. So there's a lot to see in September Night Sky. Over now to Paul Abel. Well, we'll come on to the September night sky very shortly. But first, we've come to a rather special observatory. Um, it's one we've not visited before, and we thought we'd do a sort of astronomical through the keyhole. So I'll give you some clues, and why don't you see if you can work out who it is we've come to visit. Well, we're inside, and, and look! A long-suffering astronomer's wife. Hello, Hello. Paul. <laughs> Hello. I'll talk to you later, if that's OK. And uh, outside, telescopes. Let's go take a look. Well, look at this. This is an immense telescope. This is actually a very specialised piece of kit. It's called a C14. So, have you guessed who it is yet? Let's go and see who's in the Astro Wendy house. Hope he's in. Hello, Ooh. Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Rather quick. Did you guess who it was? We thought we'd come and visit your Astro Wendy house. Why do you call it a Wendy house? This is my Astro cabin. This is where I do all my setup for observing. And out there is where I do all my observing. Let's go and have a look and see what's in the September sky. OK. So this is... You don't have an observatory, then. This is where you observe from. I like to be out underneath the skies. I don't like to be constricted in an observatory. I feel more connected to it like yeah, this. Yeah, it is lovely. I have to say, I've seen the Milky Way from this garden. It is spectacular. It just sort of arches over. You've got no light pollution. It almost casts shadows. I'm very <laughs> envious. Anyway, on with the night sky, September. So Venus is going to be having a nice little encounter with the star Regulus in Leo, isn't it? Yeah, actually, this is going to be quite exciting. And I'm going to throw a challenge open to the Here viewers with this one, <laughs> because at the end of the month, about the 30th, if you get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, you'll see Venus really close to that bright star Regulus in, in Leo the Lion. Now, if you can follow it over the next few days, it gets closer and closer to the star. Pick it up on the 3rd of October and you'll see Venus really close to Regulus in the morning sky, About again, about 4 o'clock in the morning. But if you can keep with it and you've got a telescope, wide field, watch Venus as the sun starts to come up, and Regulus, and you should be able to keep both objects in view, even though the sky has gone bright blue. And that's amazing, because you can then see a star. I tell you what, if you get any <laughs> images or drawings, get any images or drawings of that, bong that on our Flickr site, we'll have a look at those. That'd be interesting. Can you see me? Do you think you'd be able to see that in binoculars? <laughs> A star in binoculars during the day. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure, actually. I think I can't see any reason why not, but it might be a bit on the threshold it of might visibility. Be. We'll see what we get. I mean, it'd be cloudy anyway, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Always <laughs> the optimist. Always the optimist. OK, let's move on to the rest of the planets, because Jupiter, wonderful Jupiter, has returned to the morning skies, really very bright, mm. and it's now in the northern hemisphere, so getting quite high. And we've had some interesting changes on the planet. Well, the North Equatorial Belt is really, really complex at the moment and very thick as well. It is. It? Well worth taking a look. But the really stunning thing about Jupiter for me, I saw it the other morning, is that you go outside and you can see it there in the sky and it's in Taurus, the bull. So you've yeah. got the Pleiades, you've got the Hyades, yes. Aldebaran and Jupiter. And together they look amazing. Well, lots of lovely things to see in the uh, September sky. Let's have some clear skies. Yeah, and look, definitely. Some tea. Ah. And here she is, Tessa. Nice hot cup of tea. Oh, chat. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We should introduce this charming lady. This is Tessa Lawrence, long-suffering wife of Pete Lawrence. As all astronomers' go wives on, are. On, tell, tell us what's it like. <laughs> what's it like to live with Pete? You be quiet. <laughs> I think the worst thing about being an astronomer's wife is that he never shuts the door. Oh. And he doesn't feel the cold. So there's a constant draft. He does when we're out camping, he never stops whinging. <laughs> <laughs> and when it all gets too much, I just banish him to his Wendy house. Yes, it is a Wendy house, isn't it? It is a Wendy it's house. Astro shit. It's a Wendy house. <laughs> anyway, thanks for inviting us over. It's, it's been a pleasure. Cool. Let's hope clear skies. Cheers. Next month, we're going to look at the autumn and winter skies and do the second part of our Mora Marathon. Until then, good night. <laughs>